race for Denver mayor. First, though, a quick update on the latest on the school shutdown that kept half a million students home from school today in the Denver metro area. Denver Public Schools is going to be open tomorrow with added security. It's the same for the 1,000 other individual school buildings across our state that were closed today. The FBI says that the woman who prompted the security scare killed herself this morning near Echo Lake in Clear Creek County. They say that she flew up here from Florida. She was obsessed with the Columbine shooting. She had made some concerning statements. She bought a gun here legally, according to law enforcement. They urged schools to close until the time that she was found. Now, we are not expecting significant developments within the next hour, but we are live on the air, so we will bring them to you here should they happen during our debate in the race for Denver mayor. This is Mayor Michael Hancock's Denver. This is also Mayor Michael Hancock's Denver. Two terms in office put Hancock's stamp on this city. That is his point of pride. His opponents say it's the problem. So, is Denver a city on the rise, fueled by ambitious new projects, greater access to city services, and a thriving economy that's working for more people? Or is Denver a city where the developers make the decisions, money talks, and it's telling people they can't afford to belong here anymore? A deep field of challengers hope to keep the mayor from getting 50% of the vote and forcing a one-on-one -on -one runoff. The challengers include Lisa Calderon, a criminal justice professor, social justice advocate, and longtime critic of the mayor. Jamie Gillis, the former head of the Rhino Art District and a consultant who works with neighborhoods to deal with development. And Penfield Tate, a former state senator with decades of experience in Denver and Colorado politics. Tonight, the mayor and his challengers lay out their view of Denver today and their visions for the Denver of tomorrow. This is the Race for Denver Mayor. Good evening, I'm Kyle Clark. And I'm Marshall Zellinger. The race for mayor of Denver is a nonpartisan race, meaning there is no party affiliation attached to the candidates. If none of the candidates here get 50% plus one of the vote, there will be a runoff in June. This is a large field. Tonight, we have invited the mayor as well as the challengers that we felt demonstrated that they have a viable chance to win this race. They're standing here in alphabetical order. They are Lisa Calderon, Jamie Gillis, Mayor Michael Hancock, who we will address as Mr. Hancock for the purposes of the debate, and Penfield Tate. Tonight's questions have not been shared with the candidates in advance. They'll have 45 seconds to answer most questions. There's a countdown clock that will be visible to them and us. And the order of closing statements was made in the sophisticated random draw of numbers and a hat. <laughs> Rebuttals and responses will be allowed at our discretion. We want you to hear the differences between the candidates while keeping things civil. So let's get started. There are half a million students in Colorado that did not go to school today because of the threat of a mass shooting. Ms. Calderon, Colorado made it a crime for juveniles to possess a handgun following the so-called summer of violence in 1993. You have described the summer of violence as a myth and called for the repeal of Denver's youth curfew, which was instituted as a result. Should we also loosen gun penalties for young people if those two are based on a myth? So uh, the myth is actually based on that that summer was no more violent than any other summer, but it impacted politicians and newcomers to the city. And as a result of that, we had very draconian laws passed against our youth. The curfew law is one of those that came out of that. It is disproportionately targeted, particularly Latino youth and black youth. Uh, so yes, it's time to retire that. Uh, we know that uh, young people are off often also working and supporting their families. So this outdated law. Uh, time has come and gone. It's actually just adding to the issue of racial profiling. So absolutely, I would repeal that. But what I asked you about was one of the other youth violence initiatives that was a result of that summer, which was tightening penalties for possession of a handgun. Would you also loosen those? Uh, well, for youth, I think, you know, the, the premise of the juvenile justice system is that the belief that young people can change, that they are, in fact, different than adults. So before I would tighten penalties on young people, I would want to learn from the past. And the past has taught us that um, by having very harsh penalties for young people, we actually incarcerate them for very long periods of time and deny them the opportunity to change. Time. Would you loosen gun laws and the penalties on young people? I would not loosen gun laws. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Ms. Gillis, are gun control laws effective when they come from local government or do you think they should be left to state and federal governments? I think local government has a role to play in it, absolutely. And I think the big thing we have to focus on when you look at this most recent issue that occurred yesterday is 
the unbelievable ability for somebody to fly in here and buy a gun with only a short wait. Why not a three-day wait? Why not opportunity to really do sufficient background checks? And I think cities, in a lot of respects, particularly with the national climate, with, the, with what's happening in our, in our discourse, we have an opportunity to be leaders, and we are seeing cities step up on a number of fronts, whether it's immigration, sustainability, or gun laws. Want to clarify, you would then lead for a statewide waiting period, or you believe that it's within Denver's purview and ability to create something on I a would local lead level? for a statewide okay. waiting period, okay. yes. Skillis, thank you very much. Mr. Hancock, you signed a piece of gun control. It was, it was a ban on bump stocks, which allow semi-automatic weapons to fire like automatics. But semi-autos were already banned in the city of, of Denver. Right. So was this about public safety or public posturing? No, it wasn't about public posturing, and we know what bump stocks have done. We saw it in Las Vegas uh, in terms of the kind of damage you can do when you modify these semi-automatic weapons. Let's just be clear. One of the things that we are also uh, continuing to talk about in Denver is the importance of us as a society to address the issues of mental health. And we really want to get to the bottom of this with this young lady who came from Florida to Denver just yesterday and put this city under a state of uh, watch and great deal of concern, closed the schools. As you pointed out, one million kids left at home today uh, because of the concerns and for their own safety. The reality is, is that a society on the federal, state level, and on the local level, we have to get serious about making the appropriate investments in mental health and doing the things necessary to get people through these very difficult patches of depression and suicidal thoughts. You say that the bump stock ban was not public posturing, yet there wasn't a single person who surrendered a bump stock as directed by Denver police. Right. I checked with your city attorney again today and there wasn't a single person who was charged under mm -hmm. that municipal ordinance. It has literally done nothing. Well, it hasn't done anything where not, you know, a bump stock uh, or a modified uh, weapon hasn't been turned in. But the reality is we also plan for the future. If, if this is something that officers look for when they go into a home to check someone out, or if we have someone we suck, suspect may have a, a modified weapon, we certainly have the laws in the books to handle it. All right, Mr. Hancock, thank you very much. Mr. Tate, would you as mayor offer more than words and symbolism on the issue of gun control as it relates to public safety? Are there concrete steps that you believe are within the mayor's power that you would take? You know, I think they are. Let me begin by thanking you for the question. I think it's important we acknowledge what's happened the last two days and learn the lessons from Columbine. And I also think it's not a time to peddle fear. This is a time for the community to come, to come together courageously to address these issues. I think there are some things that the city can do. Um, I think that we have made some progress in terms of limiting the scope of concealed carry permits. That's important, even though the legislature has attempted to usurp that authority from local government. Um, the bump stock ban is one thing, but as you pointed out, it wasn't necessary because no one had one here in the city. Uh, part of what we need to do, I think, is work with neighborhoods organizations, the community, and law enforcement to talk about what sorts of things they would recommend to help improve the safety for them in addressing needs in the community. Mr. Tate, thank you. I just want to clarify, you said no one had a bump stock in Denver? Or, no. or nobody came forward and surrendered one and the city didn't have the will to prosecute under the ordinance? The latter. No one surrendered one and the okay. city didn't prosecute. All right, thank you. Let's take a step back and look at the big picture now. Uh, I want to hear through your eyes Denver's challenges and opportunities, the state of the city essentially, both positive and negative. We'll start with Mr. Hancock. You know, I want the people of Denver to really embrace the fact that together, collectively, the people of Denver, uh, my administration, all the sectors and industries of this city really came together to lift this city out of the recession. The depths of the recession that, quite frankly, were devastating for homeowners, for neighborhoods. And eight years later today, we are, we are arguably the most economically vibrant city in the country. We're also uh, know, known as one of the best countries in America in which to live. We're a desirable city in which to live. Rapidly growing cities also have challenges, and we have our challenges. We certainly acknowledge that. Great, a great city cares for her people. And so that's why we've leaned in. We have not been afraid to lean in on challenges around housing, around homelessness, around mobility, around neighborhood sustainability, planning for the future. That's what great cities do. And that's what we've been doing for the last eight years as we recovered from this recession. Mr. Hancock, you talk about those positives. Would anybody who is up here, if they were mayor for the last eight years, been able to say, I did those things? I don't know. I know that we've been able to do it. And in partnership with uh, the people of Denver, we've made some tough decisions. My first year, I asked the people of Denver to de-bruce this city so we can take our tax revenues and reinvest in our infrastructure, hire more police officers and firefighters, and signal to the business community we were open for business to move this city forward. It worked. All I can say is what we've done.
Mr. Tate, same thing, positive negatives with the state of the city right now. Uh, you know, the, you, you can clearly say the economy is stronger, but you have to acknowledge the fact that it's stronger and better for whom, which is the fundamental problem and the issue I hear as I visit with all of you in the community. It is clear that the growth that has happened has not been well managed, has not been well guided and directed. Gentrification has destroyed certain neighborhoods. We lead the nation in terms of um, gentrification of Latinos out of the city. We lead the nation in terms of the least affordable marketplace for millennials who won't be able to save money for a housing down payment. We don't have enough attainable or affordable housing. The homeless situation is worse than anyone can remember in our existence, and the roads are a cluttered mess. So, yeah, we've had growth, but it hasn't been well-directed or well-guided. I'll just give you real quickly some positive. I heard a lot of negative about the city for the last eight years. What's good? We have some new restaurants. We have some <laughs> nice amenities. We have some big buildings that most of us can't afford to live in. Ms. Calderon? Yeah, I grew up in Denver and raised my family here. So one of the reasons I'm running is because I love Denver. So there's a lot to love about Denver. Our green spaces, which I want to preserve. Um, and, you know, I want to preserve our healthy air. I'm a bicyclist, and so I'm very concerned. I had a child with chronic asthma, um, and I'm concerned that our air is getting much more polluted. I remember the days of the brown cloud. The reality is we're creating a Denver for the haves and have nots, those with access and those without access. So if you have access, uh, Denver's doing great for you. The $120,000 a year household income of the folks who live downtown, um, they're doing pretty well. And that's who this city is being built for. So uh, I wanna build Denver for the rest, the rest of us, those who have been left out of the prosperity of Denver. Who is someone that does not have access? How do you define that? Well, one of them is uh, one of the mayoral candidates who was not invited tonight, Kaylin Heffernan, and I think she was an important voice to include. She was, she is a disability rights activist, homeless rights activist, um, and it hasn't worked for her and people like her. And you know, the fact that they're even shut out of the dialogue, I think, is problematic. So it just it continues on with folks who um, are, you know. Don't, are, don't have access to the mayor. Uh, Colorado Public Radio did a great spot on those who are lawyer lobbyists who are in the mayor's inner circle. That's not the homeless community. And Ms. Gillis. There's, there's no doubt that Denver is an extraordinary city. No doubt. Um, it's the stress of the growth that has people frustrated right now. And the mayor has consistently, we've heard him talk through this election about how nobody could have anticipated the growth. Nobody could have anticipated the pains that came with the growth. But we saw the growth happening uh, back in 2014 when we saw buildings, permits being pulled. We knew it was underway. And in those last five years, we have made very little moves to invest in all the things that we need to truly create a sustainable city. Transportation, intracity transit. We've bumped back our sustainability goals. We're you know, destroying our parks to accommodate development in I-70. So we haven't accommodated those things as we have grown. Some of the people who support you are developers. Mm -hmm. Didn't they benefit from the growth that you're railing against here? Not all, not all developers are bad people. You need um, people to build things, to start businesses, to do things in your city. And I think that the people that support me, which are a handful of small local developers, have really tried their best to invest in good, thoughtful projects, affordable housing, uh, repurpose buildings, investing in small business. Those are the types of things that are also benefiting the local community. If I can, I think it's important to note that what caught us off guard was the pace of our growth, not the growth itself. I mean, we have projections, but no city has grown like Denver in the last 25 years, 110,000 people in the last 10 years. And what caught us off guard was the pace. At one point, we were growing by 10, excuse me, by 1,000 people per month. The region was growing by 4,500 people per month. And so the reality is that if you look at cities like Denver facing this kind of massive growth, I think we responded pretty well and we have initiatives that are moving us and forward. And we'll get more, we'll get more into growth and development shortly. The way that this uh, election works for folks who aren't familiar is that if no candidate reaches 50% plus one in the vote, then there's gonna be a runoff. It's gonna feature two people, all right? And let's just be frank here. It is likely to be Mayor Hancock and, and one of his challengers. So I have a question for the challengers here. Provided that there is a runoff with the mayor and you're not in it, would you vote for anybody else up here other than him? Ms. Calderon, anybody but Hancock? 
not anybody but a Hancock. I'd vote for Kaylin Heffernan, who is not here, because I think, again, she's an important voice around the disability community and, if she's and access. she's not in the runoff and it's somebody else, would you vote yeah. for, any, for Mayor would, Hancock over any of the other challenges? I would vote for Penfield Tate next, yes. Okay. Ms. Gillis, anybody but Hancock and I would off. vote for anybody but Hancock, either Lisa or Penn. Mr. Tate, anybody but Hancock? I'd vote for Lisa Calderon. Okay, very good. There's no way to ask you that, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, let me ask you all this, beginning with Mr. Hancock. Is there any place in the city of Denver where you don't feel safe? No. I feel safe all around Denver, Colorado. Ms. Gillis, is there any place in Denver you don't feel safe? I think... I think there's places downtown where if I'm walking alone, depending on the time of day, depending on the situation, where you certainly feel uncomfortable as an individual. Mr. Tate, is there any place in Denver you don't feel safe? If I were out at 2 a.m. in the morning in Lodo, yes, I wouldn't feel safe, but I don't tend to go out to Lodo at 2 in the morning. That's why I never see you there. All right. <laughs> Ms. Calderon, anywhere in the city that you don't feel safe? So generally, I mean, again, being born and raised here, I'm comfortable in every part of the city. Um, so I wouldn't say it's necessarily a particular part of the city. I would say as a woman, then there are safety concerns if I'm out alone late at night, but I'm comfortable in Denver. Let's talk about the persistent problem of homelessness in Denver. This is gonna be by a show of hands. Who here would continue the current administration's policy of homeless sweeps, clearing areas of people and their belongings? You call them sweeps, I don't refer to them as sweeps. No one we raised continue our cleanups. Mr. Hancock raised his hand. Also by a show of hands, do you support Initiative 300, the so-called Right to Survive initiative, which rolls back Denver's camping ban? No one here supports Initiative 300. Mr. Tate, in the first 100 days of being mayor, you plan to solve homelessness in Denver, and your policy on your website says you'll work with nonprofits and private providers as though no mayor has done this before. So tell me how talking to the same people that are already working with the homeless population does anything that we're not already doing. Sure, and my plan is not to solve homelessness, but that's my priority and that's what I'll address in the first 100 days. And it goes back to your initial question, Marshall. We've got these sweeps, and I don't care what someone else tries to call them, because you're not just cleaning the sidewalks and putting people back, you're sweeping them off the street. And we've got a homeless ban. The city's been sued because of these policies, and we had to settle the lawsuit because they're of questionable constitutionality. And, and that simply shows misguided efforts and misguided priority. You're right, other mayors have talked to the homeless community, but I think what you see now with the lawsuit and with 300 is a new force, a new vibrancy in the homeless serving community where they want a mayor to lean in to help accelerate and get rid of red tape to permit more shelter space. Uh, I want to ask Mr. Hancock, you said you're against Initiative 300, didn't see your hand raised, yet Denver's camping ban is rarely enforced, or at least it's not consistently enforced. If you don't support public camping and homeless sleeping in public spaces, why don't you have the city enforce the camping ban on a nightly basis? We do enforce it, and, and the reality is because of the, the enormous growth that we've had in Denver, which has also contributed to our homelessness, as well as the amazing um, opiate and methamphetamine addictions that have occurred across this nation, but certainly are impacting Denver, and of course our mental health challenges that we have in almost every community in this city or in this country and throughout Denver. We do move in, particularly when it's a public health and safety issue with regards to the homeless as well as the general public. There's no higher responsibilities, Mayor, that I have than to protect every resident of Denver uh, against public threats to their public health and public safety. And what we see, as we have seen recently, in these encampments where we're finding fecal matter, we're finding urine needles, and of course we also have some felonious assaults that have occurred, we have to move in a, as, a, as a public safety issue. So if you don't see any of that, that's okay? They can camp, they can sleep? You know, listen, the police department, our navigators, have worked to build a relationship with the homeless so that we can try to move them in and direct them to services. That's our first objective in dealing with the homeless. And if we continue just to bring a hammer and not a carrot, then we're not going to be able to build that relationship and ultimately help to move them indoors for their own safety and well-being. But Thank wait you. a minute. The, the, the relationship is so good. That's why the city sustained a class action lawsuit on behalf of the homeless community. All right, Mr. Tate, thank you. I want to continue this conversation because I think people are passionate about the idea of finding solutions for people who are experiencing homelessness. Yeah. And I want to introduce a question from John Enslin. You all know him. He covered Colorado for a quarter century for the Rocky. He's back here in town covering Denver for our partners at Colorado Politics. You know, I walk around the city a lot, and every day I see a homeless person living in just abject squalor. 
a, a woman who sleeps sitting up with a blanket over her head, a guy sprawled out at night on a cold marble floor. Candidates, I'm not going to ask you about your position on homelessness here. What I am asking you is this. Are there some people who, despite all the money that's been spent on homelessness, uh, despite the new shelters, despite the camping ban, are there some people that are just beyond the reach of this city in terms of homelessness? Or, if you believe otherwise, what can you do about these folks? Ms. Gillis, John's question, are some people beyond help? I think everybody deserves our help and everybody deserves dignity in this city. Um, there's different uh, phases of homelessness, different types of homeless people, some chronically homeless who need mental health support, who have no families, and they need housing with supportive wraparound services with, in some cases, permanent care. But they deserve to be invested in as much as people who have fallen onto the street because of hard times. I met a gentleman uh, down on Lawrence Street last week, 65 years old, lost his daughter and his wife in the same year, had to cover their expenses, and is homeless for the first time in his life hasn't been able to get into housing for 20 months. These are the types of people that just need a hand up, help, a hand, a hand to get help, to, excuse me. Ms. Calder, on this idea of the folks who are stuck in the most chronically persistent homelessness. So no, I don't believe anyone's beyond help. I'm the only one up here who's been a direct service provider. It's work that I did for 20 years. Uh, I was a legal director for survivors of domestic violence and when they decide to leave home, guess what, they're homeless. I would hate for them to be talked about the way the mayor has just described homeless people. I think it's stereotyping and inflammatory. I've been homeless myself as a youth escaping violence in the home uh, from age 17 to 20. So it really discourages me, dismays me to see the leader of our city talk about poor people, homeless people, and desperate people in the way that he has in such derogatory terms. I also want to correct something. Um, you assume that I'm against 300 just because I didn't say I endorse it. Uh, I don't endorse any initiative or candidate. I'm focusing on my own race, but I support the principles behind it. I support the organizers behind it, and I think it's obscene the amount of money that is being spent to defeat it. Can I Are you going to vote for it? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. I, I actually I want to give Mr. Hancock an opportunity to respond to what you said there. Um, do you feel like you are stereotyping people when you describe the issues that are seen in the streets? And then I'm also just curious. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the people that you're sweeping off the streets are your constituents? They are my constituents. And okay. I've gone down, I've talked with my constituents who happen to be homeless. The reality is we have 3,500 homeless in our city. 20% of them on a, on a regular basis we see on our streets, 700 of them. We worked very hard, have worked very hard to house them, to make sure there's shelter beds for them, to address the issues of mental health, to, to try innovative programs like our social impact uh, bond program that houses and uh, permanent supportive housing, partnering with par uh, stakeholders throughout the city of Denver to address this. But I've said from day one, when it comes to homelessness, the city of Denver is not going to do it or uh, address this by itself. We've got to continue to focus on addressing the challenge of each individual who happens to be homeless in the city of Denver. City Idol spends over $100 million and has a worse homeless challenge than the city of Denver. So it's not an issue of money. It's an issue of being strategic and hitting the issues. And that's what I speak to are the issues that impact homelessness. M Mr. Hancock, thank you. Ms. Keller, I'm back to you. You've spoken about the idea of shrinking the public safety budget, not redirecting dollars to uh, restorative justice or law enforcement that you think would be more productive, but just straight up shrinking the public safety budget. Why is taking dollars away from public safety a good idea? I actually have spoken about redirecting dollars. So um, our you public- Shrink the public safety budget. That's what I'm asking yes, you about. Yes, and yeah. so what I would shrink is the bloated, top-heavy executive management that has um, grown under this administration. I mean, you know, we have a, uh, our Denver's Road home used to be run by a buddy of Michael Hancock from the Urban School, or Urban League days, and he ran that program into the ground. But guess what? He got essentially promoted sideways to the Sheriff's Department is making six figures, and people still can't figure out what he does. Those are the kinds of positions I'm talking about. I've worked in Denver's jails for eight years. I know the struggles that the staff have in, in those jails. They need help, they need support, they need more funds for direct services and mental health resources. We don't do that by hiring more more lawyers in the mayor's administration. Thank you. 
Mr. Hancock, former auditor Dennis Gallagher recently emailed city employees accusing you of creating a pay to play system where companies and elected leaders benefit and not the people you represent. Late last year, we found out the bidding process for the expansion of the Colorado Convention Center was compromised with internal shenanigans between a construction company and the company the city hired to run that project. Mm -hmm. You're the head coach. Where'd you fail? The reality is the moment it was brought to our attention, by the way, by a city employee who began to see something that was not quite adding up and was out of quite awry. That city employee did the very appropriate thing, and that was to notify his superiors so that we can move in. We immediately moved in to address the situation. We didn't wait a moment. We investigated. The city attorney's office took this issue on and immediately moved in to begin to address the challenge, and that was an active investigation. But that city employee did the very appropriate thing in raising it and uh, raising the issues and making sure that we are able to address it. The reality is this, we can't and will not tolerate that sort of behavior. The fact that it was exposed, the very brazen emails that were being passed along uh, were disturbing and we did the right thing by moving it forward to the appropriate authorities, the district attorney and now the attorney general is also involved. What about the idea of this pay to play, that, that people close to the city, there's a reason for that? Now, you know, the reality is this, being mayor of the city is the greatest honor I've been given since being, you know, becoming a father and marrying Mary Louise. I wake up every morning with a commitment and a dedication to go work on behalf of the people of Denver. The reality is, is that I've been in politics for a long time. I do have friendships and relationships with people dating way back before I became mayor. And the reality is this. The people of Denver are my top priority, not developers. I'm very fortunate to have relationships with people all across the in, in different industries. And no one talks about hospitality. No one talks about tourism. No one talks about financial services. All these industries have raised up, partnered with my administration to help move the city forward out of the recession. And we should be proud and embrace the fact that this, all the industries have made a difference. And as a result, we have the lowest unemployment rate in the nation. I'll tell you, you're somebody. You're talking about that next yeah. thing. Sometimes the words that we hear from people in the public are different than the words that you typically hear in a campaign, so I want us to talk about one of those words now. Do you think that a lot of Denver's new development is ugly? And, and then, okay, so there's that, and then there's the question, what role, if any, does the city and the mayor have in what stuff looks like? Ms. Gillis. Yes, it is ugly, and we hear that consistently, the development and the design. Some of it's tied to our zoning code, the way zoning was redone in 2010. Um, and we have a large role to play in that. The mayor appoints the head of planning. The mayor appoints the planning board. Our zoning code can dictate the form, the function, the materials, how developments look. We've seen neighborhoods increasingly, and I've, I'm working on my second design overlay right now, using these additional zoning tools to mandate that buildings don't be built like big boxes that they have some materials that fit in with the character of the rest of the neighborhood. But we've put the impetus on neighborhoods to fight for character themselves when the city should be leading on that. So I pose the question, but then I'm, then I'm going to ask you, why should you or the people you like impose your taste standards on the rest of the community? I, I, I think that's a fair question. I think there's probably, there's obviously always a line in that, but we've seen other cities, neighborhoods, communities use design standards, design guidelines very effectively to make sure that as infill comes into our neighborhoods and communities, it at least gives something back to the community. Mr. Hancock, is a lot of new Denver ugly? I've seen some ugly buildings. <laughs> I've also seen some pretty nice buildings where there's some good innovation and good design that's been a part of it. And Jamie's correct. It's about our zoning code. It's about our design overlays and it's ultimately our design guidelines that really help us to, to, to frame this. But let me share this with you. Kyle, just recently, or, or a couple of months ago, I had a conversation with a Mount Bello resident who showed me a picture on her phone of a building that was being built right across the street from her. It was the ugliest building. I can't even tell you what fabrication it was. And then immediately I said, you know, let's get a hold of the, of the planning department, see where this came from. It was a use by right, clearly within, but the developer didn't even have the courtesy to have a conversation with the community in terms of what you might want to look at every day. Those are the sort of things that our comp plan 2040 addresses going forward. And I'll tell you that former planner uh, Brad Buchanan and I sat and had a conversation said these are the sort of things that we've got to double down on going forward.
Mr. Tate, let me ask you, do you think a lot of the new development in this city is ugly and is it the mayor's business? Uh, it is ugly and it should be the mayor's business. And if you go in and you're, if you're in neighborhoods and you talk to people, they'll tell you that the problem we have is not just with the pace of development, but what it looks like and what it does to our communities. And the fact that this administration is so disconnected and inaccessible, no one listens to our point of view. No one asks us what we think. Developers hire all the lobbyists and the lawyers and the consultants who are friends of the mayors, we can't get an audience with anyone. And when we turn around, something's going vertical in our neighborhood that we would object to. But even when we object, when we show up to public board meetings, no one pays attention to us. So it ties back to your prior question of access and pay to play. You know, one thing that was noted Mr. in the- Tate, I'm sorry, you're out of time. We're gonna have to hold it there. Ms. Calderon, what do you think about this idea of people calling New Denver ugly? Is that elitist? Is it fair? What do you make of it? Well, as a college professor who teaches history, I think it's really important that we respect our history. Um, you know, we have to learn from it. And also growing up in Denver, I was educated in those institutions. I graduated from North High School and uh, went to St. Dominic's Parish. I mean, these beautiful built buildings. And so we need to do everything to, we can to preserve them. It's not just a matter of zoning. It's a matter of uh, political will. Uh, we don't have a historic preservation inventory in this city. Um, communities have been asking for that. Um, we need to know which areas are vulnerable to gentrification, to scrape offs. And if we don't have data, if we don't have uh, the, the, the list to say, yeah, these communities are vulnerable um, to development, um, we're going to lose a lot of our essential history in Denver. Can I ask you a clarification there? When you say gather this data about mm -hmm. a neighborhood that's, that's vulnerable to gentrification and scrape offs, what are you actually willing to do to limit someone's property rights to change a piece of land that they own if you have that data? Well, I'm a homeowner. I certainly respect pro property rights. I, that's, to me, not so much the issue. We have to live in community. So I'm for smart growth development, which means returning to the village. And in the village, we are looking out for each other. Um, it's not just a matter of, you know, who wants to build a McMansion? How is it fitting with the community? Um, is that interfering with our uh, ability to have affordable housing in the neighborhood? So it's not just about individuals. It's about all of us together. Thank you. You're all seeking Denver voters to choose you as mayor. Ms. Gillis, since 2011, when Mr. Hancock was elected, voter records show you've only voted in half the elections. I know you lived out of the country for some of that time, mm -hmm. but if you want to lead the city of Denver, why didn't you care enough to vote absentee? I think it's, it's a great question. And, you know, I was traveling abroad, Singapore and the UK here for uh, most of that time, a good chunk of that time. And it's, it's, a, it's a big task to vote while you're abroad. And it's my bad for not doing that. But I also think um, it's important to note that this is an, an incredibly important time in our city, in our country. And a lot of people are aw awoken to politics at any given time. Um, I didn't realize that there was a litmus test for being willing to step up and take a leadership role in the city. And I think the other important point to note is I've been very actively engaged in community work, in affordable housing, working on a number of things in the city over the last few years. You only voted in one of the two previous mayoral elections that Mr. Hancock won. This is a personal question, I know, but by a show of hands for all of you, who voted for Mr. Hancock in 2011 and or 2015? <laughs> now, Mr. Hancock, we looked at some old state legislative maps and, and we think for a time you might have lived in Mr. Tate's Legislative district, yes. did, did you vote for Mr. Tate when he was at the state legislature? No, I voted for him. I helped uh, get him elected. Is there any kind of regret that you have that you can't <laughs> see him qualified to be mayor? No, no regret. But, you know, it's not a question of being qualified for mayor when you ran for the state senate. All right, Mr. Mm -hmm. Hancock, you declared that affordable housing is your number one priority. Mm -hmm. At the same time that your administration lost the handle on 25% of the city's affordable housing stock through lax compliance and some other issues. Mm -hmm. How do you account for such a profound failure on your number one priority. I appreciate that, Kyle. I'll tell you that this challenge around compliance did not start with my administration, but it's certainly going to end with my administration. And the moment we determined, this is with new leadership coming into the housing division, that we had challenges with some of the inventory in terms of the houses that were under our affordable housing program, we began to move in. And let me be clear, this was an entire system failure. Title companies are supposed to check, so make, make sure there are no challenges with the title, make sure they're transferring under the law and under the rules in which, which uh, they were purchased and built. 
and we were supposed to have tighter controls internally. And so it was a complete failure across the system. We've been able to recapture half of them. We're continuing to work with a smaller pool of them, but most of them were just documentation issues that we had, we corrected and are, come, are back into our system. Few of them have been resold uh, to, to people who qualify under the program. Mr. Hancock, thank you. So Mr. Tate, I would like to ask you about your plan for affordable housing in Denver, but first to something that Mr. Hancock acknowledged there, uh, an issue of how do you right the wrong? How do you fix the mess? Do you think that it was fair for the Hancock administration to force homeowners to comply with affordable housing regulations or possibly sell at a loss if they did nothing wrong to get into that house? Was that fair? No, you've got good faith purchasers who honored their contracts, paid their money, took title to homes. It's the city's fault, it's this administration's fault that our tax dollars weren't properly protected and looked after with a program and with oversight that kept track of these homes that were bought into the inventory. So that means you'd be willing to lose that home to do I, right by the homeowner, I, then you would lose it from the affordable housing stock. I think we expose the, the city to additional legal risk if someone did nothing wrong in buying the home because we, the administration, didn't pay attention. Okay, I wanna give you full time for the opportunity for you to outline what specific tangible changes you would make to, to Denver's affordable housing program to hold on to our current units and to add them quickly. Sure. We need to expand our inventory. You may have seen on the recent website, Denied by Denver, we now have an affordable housing provider who refused to be, refuses to build in Denver because the city has changed the qualification standards for some of its programs. So now applicants have to have a greater down payment to in order to buy into the affordable inventory. I would change that immediately. We then need to get together with um, community, act, community groups and developers, land banking, land trust, using linkage fee dollars, using inclusionary housing fee dollars, and looking at the potential of perhaps a bonding package to raise enough capital to invest land and money to incentivize the development of attainable housing throughout the city, because I also don't support the concept that all of this housing ought to be built in one neighborhood. It ought to be spread throughout the city. Mr. Tate, thank you. We talked about Initiative 300. This is now 301. It would decriminalize so-called magic mushrooms. Tell Denver police, make it your lowest priority. No city in America has taken such a step. Now I'm looking for a yes or no. We'll go individually here. Ms. Calderon, do you support Initiative 301? Again, I'm neutral on initiatives, but I can explain my answer. Can you tell me, are you going to vote yes or no? Uh, yes, I'm in support of decriminalization. Ms. Gillis? No. Mr. No. Hancock? No. Frank. Denver City Council overwhelmingly approved the idea of a supervised drug injection site, a place where someone could use heroin or meth while under medical supervision. Democrats in the state legislature abandoned the plan to give Denver permission for this, but it's likely to come back up next year. So I'm curious, by a show of hands, who supports opening a supervised drug injection site in Denver? Ms. Calderon, I will note, is the one who raised her hand. Uh, if I'd asked this question months ago, Mr. Hancock would have raised his hand back when he fully supported the idea. Then you came on my program and you walked it back, but it still seems unclear. Mm -hmm. How did you go from fully supportive of uh, this idea to after the political firestorm, no longer supportive? Yeah, I never faced a firestorm, Clark, uh, Kyle. The reality is this, while I am the mayor of the city, we must have the, the, the courage to be the leader, to make tough decisions, and also the courage to willing to tell someone, you know what, this is a personal belief I have that I don't support that. But if the city council believes it's an invaluable tool to put into the tool chest, and I've always been an advocate for putting into a tool chest, and I explained this to you on the show when I came to see you, then let's put in a tool chest. But there are a lot of regulatory, uh, legal, and civic challenges that must be overcome before a supervised injection site is open anywhere in Denver. There's a reason why cities like Seattle, and uh, I want to say Pittsburgh, uh, somewhere in the, in the east, have agreed to or wanted to do this, but it's never open because of those same hurdles. Philadelphia, yeah. Philadelphia, so, uh, yes. Maybe I'm just dense, but I still don't understand yeah. whether you support adding a supervised... I, I, I don't personally support it, Kyle, but I, I recognize that it should be in the tool chest for conversation and discussion. If the leaders of city council believe we ought to have that, let's put it in the tool chest. But when we have the conversation about actually implementing, there's going to be some very deep conversation that occurs because of the serious impacts and challenges and concerns that people in the city of Denver have articulated along the way. Thank you. We have another S word. Denver has adopted sanctuary city policies limiting city workers' ability to proactively cooperate with immigration agents. It's a move applauded by immigration rights advocates and called a chilling effect on law enforcement by the head of the police union. 
Would you roll back any of Denver's sanctuary city policies or move to even greater levels of protections for people here illegally, kind of like what San Francisco offers? We'll start with Ms. Calderon. Yeah, before I answer that, I want to rebut something that the mayor said. You know, I'm, again, the only service provider who has worked with people on the street who are suffering from drug addiction. And um, I think this is what the difference is, that I would use evidence-based practices in terms of what works as opposed to what's politically expedient. I think what you saw with the mayor is that once the winds changed and he saw that there was a lot of fear-mongering whipped up, then he backed off uh, of that initiative. So, you know, the, the reality is when I worked with people in the jails, they would beg to go into treatment, but there were no treatment beds. So we can't continue to um, punish, stigmatize people when there is no help or services out there. It gives you five seconds for sanctuary city policies. Yes, I support sanctuary cities. Thank you. Ms. Gillis. Thank you. I support the policy that has been passed by city council. I think it's our responsibility to um, ensure we're doing right by everybody who's in our city, but also abiding by the law where we're required to, by federal law. Um, in addition to that, I think that we do have more work that we can do in helping people get to citizenship. We have heard across the city meeting with people, there are log jams for people that are looking to become citizens. It's costly, um, it takes a lot of time. Some people get caught in a loophole of being here legally and then running out of time. I think that there's a lot we can do to help support people becoming members of our community and members of um, citizens of the United States. Mr. Tate. I support our position as a sanctuary city. I support the work we're doing. I would not roll back the current program. I would explore what other cities are doing to provide additional um, support and protection for immigrants in their cities. And I would do the same thing here in Denver. Does it create a, a new stigma for Denver on top of other stigmas we have as we talked about safe injection site possibility and legalization of certain drugs? I don't think it's a stigma to say that as a city you're welcoming people who want to come and work to have a better life. If we can build more affordable housing and help get more of the homeless off the street, that'll resolve some of the stigmas that Denver has now as being the least affordable city for millennials in the country. I won't ask you, Mr. Hancock, if you support your own policies. Uh -huh. I, I, I will ask you this. So President Trump has made this threat that he is going to send busloads of migrants, which will acknowledge that that's a pejorative term, but that's, that's what the president's talking about. Busloads of migrants from the border to cities. I saw you on CNN this week, and you were asked a number of times, is Denver willing and able to accept migrants directly from the border as the president wants? But I didn't hear a direct answer from you. Are we or aren't we? I said we have remained and we remain and will continue to be an inclusive, welcoming, inclusive city. You might recall there was a time when President Obama was in office that we were, we, there may have been a time we were going to receive, um, you know, migrants from Honduras and El Salvador fleeing violence like they are today. And that moment we stood up and said, we will welcome them into our city. We will welcome them today, as we said when Obama was president. And, and, I, and I recall that there was a discussion yep. about which service providers might link up with them and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But is Denver financially capable? Are we structurally capable of adding an influx of, of new residents who don't have community ties, may have no interest in even being in this city or this state? Absolutely, Kyle. The, the, you know, the, the question is, is a fair one, and the one I answered on CNN as well. I said, listen, this has to be a partnership with the state and the federal government if they come to any city. I just joined a letter today of most mayors of major cities across this country who made it very clear to the Trump administration and to Congress. One, we expect you to fix this and to address it as the United States of America would address it. But two, as major city leaders in this country, we also expect that we would carry forth the values of inclusion, of being welcoming, and really the tenets of what made this nation the nation that it is today. Thank you. Let's talk about Denver's explosive growth. We had to cut you off earlier about that. It's another question from veteran journalist John Enslin with our partners at Colorado Politics. Candidates, how much is too much? We've had unprecedented growth in this city over the last decade, and the projections call for a lot more. I'm wondering, in your view, is there a point at which it's too much? Uh, can a city reach a capacity? Or do you think a city is a dynamic thing that really doesn't have a concept of capacity? Tell me your thoughts. And we'll start with Mr. Hancock. Does the city have capacity? We certainly have capacity. We don't know what that capacity is now, but we certainly understand the triggers that will indicate that we have a challenge in terms of our capacity. 
I want us all as city of Denver to take a bow and to embrace the fact that we are the most desirable city in the country. You built that willing to invest in your infrastructure, willing to say we're open for business and willing to be innovative and creative and to embrace the entrepreneurial spirit and be a welcoming and open city. But we also have to allow for the market to, to work itself out. We're already seeing kind of the ebbing of the population growth in Denver. People are already beginning to choose. Maybe Denver has grown too much and they're moving other places. These are not necessarily long-term residents are moving other places. These are people who come here and say, okay, we're gonna try it somewhere else. But we should be proud of the fact that we're the most desirable city in the country and let's let the market figure that out going forward. You started with, yeah, there's capacity. When do we know what capacity is? Again, we, we are putting in the measures to address the issues of mobility and congestion in the city of Denver, pressures on housing, uh, which tells us that we, if we bring the resources to bear, we can actually accommodate the growth that has come into Denver. I don't think we've reached that point yet, but it, the market will indicate to us when we have. Mr. Tate, can the city of Denver eat too much? We can eat too much, but I don't think we have. The problem we have is what we've eaten hasn't been well managed, hasn't been well directed or well guided. And that's what you hear in neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood. We've grown in a fashion that isn't compatible with neighborhoods. That's why we lead the nation in terms of Hispanic gentrification. We've grown in a fashion that's not sustainable for millennials. That's why we're the least affordable city for millennials and why we're the fifth most fled city where millennials are coming, staying and leaving and the gentrification in our neighborhoods, we're all experiencing that because we don't have a city government or an administration that listens, that responds, and lets us in the communities play a role in determining how and where we grow. So am I understanding that capacity is based on management style? Capacity is impacted by management style. What you can afford to handle, what you can handle, is a function of how you let your growth and development occur. And we've seen other communities where the sprawl has gotten ahead of them. What has happened here is we've allowed such helter-skelter development. The roads are a congested mess. Neighborhoods are impacted by cars veering off from major arterials because people just can't pass through the city. Thank you, Mr. Tate. Ms. Calderon. Ask anyone who sat in traffic in rush hour seven days a week, because that's what our rush hour looks like now, uh, whether we're at capacity, and, and many of them would say yes. Our infrastructure has not grown what the city has grown. I think it's interesting that the mayor wants to take credit for all of the growth, but take no responsibility for any of the growing pains that go with it, uh, including people being pushed out of their communities. Um, you know, when we are, uh, when the mayor is pushing this aerotropolis and the sprawl out to DIA, um, essentially what we're doing is adding to the congestion of our roads instead of investing in our infrastructure. Um, it's one of the reasons why residents overwhelmingly rejected Amazon coming here because we know that we're at capacity in terms of what our infrastructure can handle, but our city leaders just aren't listening to us. So I heard you say many of them would say yes about people stuck in traffic. So yes, you agree there's a capacity to Denver? Yes, I, yes, I do. I, I, capacity to what our infrastructure can tolerate? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Gillis? Cities are evolving, growing things, and cities can accommodate a lot of growth and change over the course of time and the course of history. We know that. It's how the change is managed. Right now, what we see is um, there is traffic issues. Uh, cost of living here is tough. People are having to work multiple jobs just to afford what they're doing. The mayor and the city council are proposing passing Denverite next Monday. Denverite is the comprehensive plan looking ahead for 20 years, focused largely on accommodating another 200,000 people in Denver and another 1.2 million in the region, largely led by rezonings and adding density all over the city. That is not gonna work. We need to invest in all the infrastructure, all the supportive services while we grow and able to support that. Um, am I hearing it like Mr. Tate, that it's based on management, that you can handle more people, just depends on who's in charge? Yeah, it's absolutely based on management and strategy and working with the community to figure out what quality of life in a livable city looks like in Denver. Thank you, Ms. Gillis. The future of the Park Hill Golf Course is uncertain at this point. It's a it's a significant open green space in our city right now, 155 acres. So I, I know you faced this question before, so I'm looking for a concise yes or no answer tonight. Would you support the city acquiring the Park Hill Golf Course to create a city park that is almost as large as Washington Park? Ms. Calderon. Yes. Ms. Gillis. Absolutely. Mr. Tate. Does that mean no development, just a park? Yes. Space? Yes. Mr. Hancock. Yes, and we're looking at other options as well. Thank you very much. Ms. Gillis, I've heard you say you don't use transit as often as you like because it doesn't go exactly where you want to go. 
You also have this idea to bring back the city's old streetcar network. Yes. How does a streetcar go where RTD buses don't, and why <laughs> streetcars instead of buses? Streetcars, I think, first of all, let's talk about the fact the city was built on a streetcar network. So that's, that's the inspiration for, for the idea for where the streetcar could go. We know that there's diff cost differential between bus, between bus rapid transit, and between streetcar. The Denver Moves Transit Plan, that's part of the comprehensive plan, contemplates all three or a mix of modes. What we've seen in other cities is that where fixed rail streetcar systems have gone in, you see economic development, you see the ability to add increased uh, density along transit, which is part of that smart, gro smart growth strategy. And it provides consistency for people, consistency in where the lines go, in timing and in service. I'm open to a variety of modes and ultimately I think that's what it'll be. But I think having the backbone be a streetcar system is my first, my first start. The state legislature is considering a bill to enact a form of rent control by a show of hands. Who believes limiting the rent hikes by a landlord is a good idea? Ms. Calderon and Mr. Tate. And I direct this question to Ms. Calderon. You've made statements in the past about redevelopment and what you've called anti-displacement policies. Mm -hmm. How does limiting a landlord's decision to raise rent help a neighborhood and not just the tenant who's paying cheaper rent? So we have some of the weakest renters' rights in Colorado. And so what we need to do is um, expand the options for renters. What I'm hearing and, you know, being someone who uh, was at once a single parent, struggled to uh, also make rent, um, when a, a landlord is just uh, spiking rent beyond what you can afford, you're eventually going to be homeless. So this is not about individual landlords. This is about what's fair uh, and what's reasonable in terms of what are reasonable rent hikes. Uh, and so increase, part of anti-displacement policies is that we are strengthening renters' rights. We're using every tool in the toolbox, um, including community land trusts, uh, to keep people in their homes because it's actually far more expensive once people are out on the streets. Thank you, Ms. Calderon. One last question, and if I could ask everybody to keep their answers a touch more brief so that we can get everybody in before closing statements. A lot of flexibility for you here. Can you name a neighborhood in Denver that you believe has been neglected and what you would do to change that? Mr. Tate. Glowville, Elyria, and Swansea, without question. Without question, they've been adversely impacted by the I-70 project, which the neighborhoods there objected to. It is considered one of the most polluted zip codes in the nation, much less in Denver. They don't have core services, they don't have many amenities, and they've been overlooked for decades. Um, that is one place where the city, you know, the, the Denver is only as good as the least welfaring neighborhood is. And so there are times when as mayor, you have to invest additional resources in communities that have been historically overlooked. And that's Globville, Swanson, and Elyria. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. I'd ask you to please ignore the time clock we're trying to get in before <laughs> closing, Ms. Gillis. I would agree with GES and I would add Montbello. Um, Montbello as a neighborhood has seen um, a lot of challenges around its schools schools being broken apart and we've heard from the kids and families there that as a result community has been broken apart. They've had transit lines pulled, still no access to fresh foods or markets. Some of the basic, most basic services that people need to thrive in their community, they've been left behind. So I think Montbello is an important focus. Ms. Calderon, a neglected neighborhood. At Global Liria Swansea, certainly, as co-chair of the Colorado Latino Forum, um, we actually sued CDOT along with the Sierra Club, not just around um, the neglected parts of the city, but the environmental impacts of expanding a 10-lane highway. Um, but I, th I think it's emblematic of a lot of neighborhoods that have been neglected, including Westwood, where I lived as a child. Um, and so I would want to prioritize resources into those areas that have been left out of the prosperity of Denver. Thank you very much. Mr. Hancock, is there a neglected neighborhood in your city? I think if you look at the inverted L that comes from Montbello, comes around, hits the elbow of Glowville, Hilaria, Swansea, into West Denver, you find neighborhoods like Montbello, Glowville, Hilaria, Swansea neighborhoods, as well as Sun Valley and Westwood. You also see where the Hancock administration began to move with our greatest investments. There was a, uh, a liquor store in Westwood, for example, that, that was going up for recertification uh, or licensing as a liquor store. And when we found that because we had done our research and we wanted to move in to begin to protect and to begin to enhance neighborhoods, we were able to get in and interrupt that liquor license. And now there's a child care center in that location. 
as a result of understanding that inverted pyramid and what the challenges are for each resident, we're able to make smarter decisions in terms of our investment. Thank you. Time for our one minute closings with that random order. Ms. Gillis goes first. Thank you very much. This election is about creating a truly livable Denver. It's the focus of our conversation. It's the focus of the strategy that we need going forward. It's about the people. It's about reconnecting community, about empowering neighborhoods, and building a truly sustainable Denver for the future. There's no doubt that there has been some benefit from the growth, but I think largely what you see in our communities is the stress and the struggle of people who are trying to make ends meet as we have grown. It's time for a clear vision. It's time for a leader who understands cities. And I have spent my entire career working in city, cities, studying cities, studying to be a city manager, really understanding how you grow smart and how you put people at the forefront of that. I'm ready to lead the city. I'm excited for an opportunity for a fresh start for Denver, for a vision, and I'm asking for your vote on May 7th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Gillis. Ms. Calderon. I'm excited. We are in uh, the viewpoint of a new era of leadership in Denver, um, one that puts people first before profits. I. Being born and raised here, I want to see a future of a city that thrives, that is more compassionate, that creates more opportunities for more people. Um, I'm ready to lead this city with 30 years of public service, uh, including 20 years of nonprofit management and four degrees, including a law degree and a doctorate in education. I would be taking a smart approach to city government, not necessarily politically popular or expedient, but what works um, so that we're listening to all the voices of all the voters of Denver, not just those who are closest to the mayor. I support independent agencies for checks and balances. The pillars of my campaign are equity, fairness, and justice, and put residents first in the future direction of development and not those who contribute to my campaign. So vote for me, Lisa Calderon, for Denver mayor as a first woman mayor of Denver. Thank you, Ms. Calderon. Mr. Hancock. Denver, it's been a real honor to be your mayor. It's the greatest honor of my life, outside of being a father and marrying Mary Louise. Over the last eight years, we've had some amazing challenges and some great triumphs. We have snatched the city out of the Great Recession. And together, we've been able to restore the vibrancy, the economic solvency, and really the desirability of the city. We live in, without question, the most desirable city in the country. This growth and our prosperity has not come without cost. We recognize that some people have been left behind. So a third term is about this. First, we want to create a more equitable and inclusive government. We want our economy to address the issues of housing. We want to make sure we address the issues of mobility, stagnation of wages, and we want to make sure people feel like they matter in the city. The second thing we want to do is to remain a welcoming and open city. We want to make sure we continue to address the issues of crime, uh, criminal justice reform. And we also want to, on a, as a third and final issue, become and stay the most progressive and modern city in the United States of America. I'm Michael Hancock. I'd be honored Thank you, to Mr. Hancock. serve as your mayor. Mr. Tate. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Penfield Tate, and I'm asking for your vote to become the next mayor of Denver. As I've traveled in the community and visited with you, you've made clear to me you want change and you want and need new leadership. I'll be a mayor that provides accessible, ethical, and transparent leadership. But this is not a time for on-the-job training. We need proof proven leadership and proven experience. I've been on the state's joint budget committee where I've written and managed multi-billion dollar budgets. I've served on the cabinet of a governor where I ran a state agency. I've served and worked with Mayor Pena who taught us how to imagine a great city. And as a finance attorney, I've built a lot of the infrastructure around the state. As a father, I share your concern about the future of our city. And I understand what the next four mean, years mean. And I would offer to you that we can't do another four minutes, much less another four years after 16 years of the Hancock administration in City Hall. I'm Penfield Tate. I'd be honored to be your mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Tate. Thank you to all of our candidates. Thank you to everyone at home who is watching. A reminder, your ballot must be received by election workers by 7 p.m. on May 7th. If there is a runoff in June, the two finalists will be invited back for a debate on 9 News. For Marshall Zellinger, I'm Kyle Clark. Good night.